Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Nasser Rajput to Manchester. I think he had some uh, connection to Manchester early in, in his career. Um, Nasser is a professor of computational pathology in computer science department in Warwick. And he also holds an under scientist position at the Department of Pathology in the University Hospitals Coventry in Warwickshire, Warwickshire NHS Trust. And he currently holds two very prestigious fellowships, uh, which are Royal Society's Wolfson Fellowship, as well as he's a Turing Fellow. Um, Nasser runs a very productive group on tissue image analytics in Warwick Computer Science, uh, where the group's focus is on developing algorithms for analysis of digitized pathology images with applications to computer-assisted grading of cancer and image-based markers for prediction of cancer progression and survival. And um, <clears throat> since January 2019, Nasser has been acting as co-director of this um, 15 million Path Lake National Center of Excellence on AI in Pathology, where he's leading the computational arm of the center. And um, Nasser has a longer introduction, but I'll stop here. And um, today he's going to talk about his work on computational pathology for PC and medicine. Thank you very much, Nasser. Uh, and over to you, you can take over from now. Thank you, Nasser, for that kind introduction. Thank you also um, to yourself and your colleagues for inviting me to speak uh, uh, at this forum. Uh, I do have a, a personal connection to Manchester uh, during the early stages of uh, my career, uh, not directly, but indirectly through my wife, who used to be a faculty in the Manchester School of Accounting and Finance. Um, but I, I do have uh, fond memories of uh, uh, staying in Manchester during the time that uh, my wife was uh, uh, working at the Manchester. Uh, business School and the School of Accounting and Finance. Um, so uh, as Mudassa said, I am a computer scientist by training, um, but I have been working with pathologists um, in our local hospital in Coventry, as well as in other hospitals across the country and, and outside the UK for over a decade now. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the emergence of this new discipline, um, I think in its own right, uh, it can be regarded as a discipline um, or a sub-discipline under pathology in medicine by the name of digital and computational pathology. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about digital pathology first um, before moving on to computational pathology. And then I would also like to talk a little bit about some of the work we have done in this space um, and um, how similar kind of algorithms could be uh, utilized for precision medicine purposes. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the Path Lake Center of Excellence that Mudassar introduced in his, um, uh, uh, his opening remarks. Um, I'll start off with the conflict of in interest uh, disclosures as is customary in our field. Um, I do have a, a PhD studentship funding from GSK that just started this term for three PhD students. Uh, Philips Healthcare are co-funding a PhD student of mine and they're also co-funding the Path Lake Center of Excellence on AI in Pathology that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, in the past, I've done consultancy for Merck and I've had uh, funding from Intel Health and Life Sciences for a PhD student uh, We just uh, finished last month. And um, even before that, I have had funding from GE Healthcare Omnix. Now with that, I would like to emphasize that uh, none of the work that I'm going to talk about has been uh, influenced uh, much by the particular products um, that, and, and uh, hardware that uh, these firms are making or any of uh, their uh, products I'm not going to uh, try and sell to you. Uh, so I'm only going to talk about our own uh, work. All right. Um, first of all, just to give a little bit of background, the practice of pathology at the moment is uh, considered to be the gold standard for diagnosis of many diseases, particularly solid tumors. Um, and uh, it is something that is absolutely fundamental to almost all of the cancer screening 
uh, processes, including breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, and uh, cytological smears of uh, uh, um, uh, cervix. Um, the fact is that the cellular pathology reporting, the complexity of that is increasing and we have more uh, aging population, which has resulted in increasing workload. However, the practice of cellular pathology is also based on the 19th century technology of the microscope. To this day, most labs around the country in the world are uh, doing their diagnosis of uh, histopathology, i.e. tissue specimens under the microscope. And that introduces um, some problems. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about them um, as we progress towards this, uh, towards the end, end of this talk. Um, so starting off with how uh, exactly the diagnosis is done in most pathology labs uh, around the world. Uh, if a patient is suspected of having cancer, uh, biopsy is taken uh, out of the, the body, um, or if a patient is already known to have some tumor using radiology imaging, for example, the uh, tissue specimen, the tumor is taken out, the surrounding normal region sometimes is taken out as well. Uh, some of the lymph nodes might be taken out. And then once the tissue is out of the body, it is fixated and embedded in uh, uh, in formalin and paraffin, respectively. And the paraffin block is then cut into thin sections, um, usually three to five micron thin sections that are then pasted onto a glass slide. And the slide is stained with the appropriate kind of dyes, usually hematoxin and eosin to bind to the DNA structures and the cytoplasmic structures, respectively. And then the slides are sent to the lab for examination. And this is what a typical pathologist office looks like. You have these trays uh, lying around with lots and lots of slides in those trays and the pathologist picks them up by hand and puts them under the microscope like this and does a visual examination um, under the microscope to try and find uh, any clues of abnormality or malignancy. And if the case is malignant, then try and look for some particular cues that could help in patient management. And remember, no diagnosis, no treatment. So this is absolutely critical to management of the patient. Once you know what the patient um, has had uh, in terms of cancer or other disease, uh, you can then begin your uh, management of the patient and you can treat the patient accordingly. Now, all of this is relying on the power of the human visual system, which is extremely powerful in recognizing various different types of patterns, such as this, for instance, um, you know, you see that something is not quite right, you know, when a train is um, not aligned with the uh, rails as such. Uh, so you can instantly recognize that this is a scene of a wreck and something has gone wrong there. And that's kind of what the pathologists are trying to do when they're looking under the microscope to try and uh, pick up uh, cues for uh, abnormality and malignancy. Um, however, when we scan this kind of picture, uh, it gets turned into numbers and we need to analyze those numbers. Now, human visual system, as powerful as it might be, has its own limitations as well. For example, in the case of counting people in this uh, picture of a crowd where you may have thousands or even tens of thousands of people and counting every individual head, can be problematic. Um, so that's where we hit limitations of uh, human visual system. There is another issue there that um, uh, we, we can often be fooled by various kinds of optical illusions. Um, so however powerful our system for uh, recognizing things around us is, uh, it is not um, free from limitations of its own. Um, and that's quite important when it comes to uh, pathology and in general uh, science, um, where I really like this quotation from Siddharth Mukherjee, um, that science begins with counting. Uh, we need to be able to measure, we need to be able to count things. When we want to do things in a systematic and objective manner, we want to understand any phenomenon in uh, a, a systematic and objective and particularly uh, as uh, we will see in a data-driven manner. 
um, and I quote this uh, from his uh, brilliant book, um, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, to understand a phenomenon, a scientist must describe it objectively. If cancer medicine was to be transformed into a rigorous science, then cancer would need to be counted somehow, measured in some reliable, reproducible way. Now, pathologists are doing this kind of counting from time to time, but suffice it to say that this is not reproducible because of the very fact that they're relying on human visual system, which is quite subjective in its judgment at times. The good news is that pathology in the UK is rapidly going digital, histopathology, i.e. tissue uh, or cellular pathology. And what that means is that um, glass slides like the ones I showed you before, uh, they can now be loaded up uh, in their dozens or hundreds uh, in uh, these trays that can be fed into the scanners. And in the scanner, there's a robotarm that picks each of those slides one by one and scans them at microscopic resolution. So what that means is that if we have a slide, this is quite a, a standard size slide, 25 millimeter by 75 millimeter. Um, we can now scan them quite um, you know, regularly at 250 nanometers per pixel. Uh, which is pretty good resolution for um, microscopic level diagnostics, and that is converted into a digitized image. Now that's really nice for ourselves, which means that this gives us lots and lots of pixel data, but also for pathologists um, who have been used to looking down the microscope like uh, my colleague here, David Sneed, in his um, office in the pathology department at Coventry Warwickshire Hospital, where the microscope is now moving out of the picture, uh, literally, and more and more diagnostics are being done, especially in COVID times, where pathologists um, can be sitting at home and, and doing their diagnosis by looking up on the screen rather than down on the microscope. And that's great news for pathology in general. Um, now, you know, there are reports being generated after looking down the microscope. And that has in the UK um, been impacted in quite a big way by the publication of this um, quite large validation study, uh, validation of digital pathology imaging for primary routine histopathological diagnostics, which was um, run at our uh, Coventry Warwickshire Hospital led by David Sneed. I was also involved on the fringes, but it still remains world's largest validation study. And it showed that diagnostics based on digital pathology imaging is non-inferior to glass slide based diagnostics under the light microscope. This was quite a large study um, involving 17 pathologists who re-reported more than 3000 cases by digital as well as glass. And of these, uh, just over a thousand were re-reported by the same pathologist and just over 2000 were reported by a different pathologist um, I, I remember again, once under the, uh, the microscope and, and uh, another time on the computer screen and involved more than 10 different subspecialities, more than 11 and half thousand slides that were looked down the microscope as well as on the digital uh, scanned images on the, on the uh, computer workstation. And what they showed was that uh, the, uh, uh, the diagnostics was non-inferior. We got more than 97% uh, agreement between digital and like light microscope based diagnoses. And that was again, great news for um, people like myself who had been working in the area for uh, some time, but also for um, rolling out digital pathology to other NHS pathology labs who could uh, on the back of this data could now use digital pathology images for routine diagnostics. Here is how a digital pathology image looks like. Um, on the screen, you're seeing a tiny, tiny part of an entire image. And if I were to run a kind of uh, Google Earth simulation of this, this is how it would go. Starting off with the whole slide view and then zooming into tinier and tinier parts of the entire image. And if I were to stop at the kind of almost at the bottom level, it's not really at the bottom level, so here we go at the bottom level, kind of street level coming from 20,000 feet. Um, in, in this really tiny part of the entire whole slide image, there are uh, a lot of different players in terms of uh, uh, the, the battle between the cancer cells and the immune cells that is going on 
Um, and now we are able to recognize every individual, uh, every single one of those cells as in cancer cells, as opposed to these uh, little blobs that are the immune cells. And we can characterize and profile quantitatively the tumor microenvironment in ways that were never possible before. Um, so that's, um, uh, that's the backdrop to uh, the rest of my talk. Um, and what I call the petascale computational pathology era that we are now beginning to enter into. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I call it petascale because um, you can scan every one of those slides um, at 250 nanometers per pixel, which means we get 100,000 times 300,000 pixels per slide. And that's uncompressed 90 gigabytes raw pixel data and just to put things into perspective as compared to uh, radiology images, such as the chest X-ray image, uh, which could be about uh, uh, one kilo times one kilo pixels. Um, you know, you could pack more than 85,000 chest X-ray images into a single whole slide pathology image. Um, so that's quite a lot of raw pixel data. Um, and uh, the fun part is that we can now unleash the kind of uh, data hungry algorithms such as the deep learning algorithms on this data and we can pull out lots of uh, very interesting statistics and, and um, mine for new patterns and trends in population data that were uh, never possible before. And just 1200,000 of these slides means that we've you know, we, we're approaching uh, over a petabyte of raw pixel data quite easily. Um, and and 12,000 slides is not a huge number. Um, we are now working with tens of thousands of slides on a routine basis um, at our local hospital. We've now scanned about half a million slides um, and, and we're bringing in a lot of those for uh, analytical purposes. Um, and as I said, this now gives us a great opportunity for uh, introducing our deep learning algorithms for early diagnosis and personalized treatment because we now have the digital images that can be mined using these deep learning algorithms. And um, it is now possible to run those algorithms in quite reasonable amount of time instead of waiting for months to train the algorithms on this number of images, we can train uh, algorithms for these number of images in a matter of um, days and sometimes hours, depending on what scale you're working at with the images. Um, and, and that's an opportunity for early diagnosis and personalized treatment because this humongous amount of data is now available with associated clinical metadata uh, for uh, probing questions uh, uh, related to early diagnosis and personalized treatment in ways that, that were never possible before. Um, so what um, uh, we have been doing in my lab for the past um, uh, many years, we've been developing a, a whole raft of algorithms going from pre-processing, cleaning up of, uh, and, and standardization of this kind of data. Think of uh, BLAST for bioinformatics. We are in those days, um, uh, you know, still quite far behind your radiology imaging and, and your computational biology. Um, but, um, you know, making uh, advances day by day, um, you know, there are more and more groups coming into the, uh, in, into the uh, picture and, and uh, the area of computational pathology is now uh, becoming uh, quite um, popular among a lot of uh, industrial players, including Google, IBM, and um, uh, Big Pharma as well. Um, and, and then moving on to analysis, recognition, uh, modeling uh, of different types of objects, uh, starting all the way from subcellular structures to cellular and, and multicellular structures and all the way to analysis of uh, a whole slide image in a kind of weak supervision manner, which I'll talk a little bit about towards the end. Um, on to synthesis of virtual tumor microenvironment, uh, modeling of the virtual tumor microenvironment and analysis of various different uh, biomarkers in multiplex ways um, that, that could be done in a data-driven manner. And in the end, this is the, the ultimate goal to be able to put all this data together with clinical metadata as well as genomic signatures uh, for prediction of uh, response to a particular kind of therapy, prediction of survival, prediction of uh, uh, risk of progression, uh, risk of recurrence, 
the kind of things that from patient management point of view, from precision medicine point of view, uh, the oncologists are uh, particularly interested in, you know, how is this patient going to do if we treat them with a particular uh, um, treatment regimen? Uh, do we need to do surgery on this patient? Do we need to only give them chemo? Do we need to give them chemo before surgery? Do we need to give them chemo after surgery? Do we need to give them immuno? Extremely expensive immunotherapy um, uh, where it's not um, you know, often more than 50% uh, responsive. Um, so all those important decisions for patient management, uh, they could be aided with the help of the data, retrospective historical data that has been collected in a lot of cancer trials, but where histology data has not been looked at at all, pretty much. Um, so, so that data is waiting to be explored. Okay, so I'll, I'll just uh, give one example of uh, the pre-processing operation, um, an algorithm that we developed together with colleagues from Leeds um, to solve the problem of normalization. Uh, and it's to do with the normalizing of the stain color distribution according to some reference image. So suppose you train your algorithms on data from one center and then you get data from another center and that looks completely different even though it's the same tissue, the same cancer, same stage of cancer even, or same subtype of cancer, but it may look completely different for various reasons. Even from the same center, maybe now you're ordering your um, stains from different supplier or the time of the day that the stains were uh, used or um, the room temperature, the temperature of the dye, the thickness of the section, so many factors that can make this color distribution of the stain look very different from uh, another day and from another lab. Uh, so the idea is how do you normalize, how do you standardize the stain color distribution? Because in the end, you're going to be working with pixel values and, and it's important to make sure that those pixel values uh, can translate from, uh, or transfer rather, from one center to another uh, uh, and, and your algorithm can be, can be useful for more than one centers. So here is, in a nutshell, the algorithm that we developed. It takes the reference image and the source image and uh, deconvolves the stains for, for the reference image and the source image. And after the deconvolution, computes some channel statistics for each of the deconvolved channels. And the deconvolution here results in not R, G, and B, because obviously that could be easily obtained, but more uh, as in hematoxylin and eosin, the two main stains that I was talking about before, and the background. Um, and then extract some channel statistics from both the target and the source images channels, uh, and then do a spline-based mapping between those channel statistics to reconstruct the normalized stain channels, and then finally reconstruct the normalized source image. And that works quite well. If you look at this distribution, a whole variety of um, hues and um, uh, uh, various uh, appearances of uh, the same stains, hematoxin and eosin, where the hematoxin is supposed to bind to uh, nuclei. So you see these blue blobs, they are uh, the chromatin inside the, the DNA that is binding to, um, and it's not, um, it's a bit fragmented when you look at the tumor cells as compared to the immune cells, and that's how we recognize these cells. Uh, but you can see that, you know, it comes in all, all types of uh, uh, colors, and uh, that was before stain normalization, and this is after the stain normalization. So it works pretty well. And then we implemented that algorithm and a bunch of other algorithms, um, and we released it as a toolbox. So if you're interested in looking at uh, a variety of different stain normalization algorithms, you can um, go to our lab pages and download the stain normalization toolbox. Um, Moving on to algorithms, and, and more recently, um, over the last few years, our focus has been completely on developing um, deep learning algorithms that are customized to the histology images and the particular kind of uh, patterns and, and uh, objects that we are seeing over and over again in these images. Um, so for instance, recognition uh, and segmentation of various different kinds of nuclei and you can see that they all look very different. They have different, they come in all shapes, sizes, and, and textures. Uh, being able to recognize every different type of cell, and not only recognize, but also segment them so we could extract various kinds of morphological characteristics for the different types of cells, uh, that is uh, uh, an important problem. 
And the way we solve this problem, um, so here you have a uh, uh, convolutional neural network, so the usual convolutional layer and the residual layers. But then we have these three heads, one head for uh, just segmenting, another head for finding the horizontal and vertical maps, and that's why we call it the hover net, horizontal and vertical maps, and that's really useful for separating neighboring nuclei, their boundaries, um, demarcating them uh, clearly. And then finally, this third head that recognizes the class of the different types of cells. So here you have just black and white picture, but here you have those colored blobs that says which type each of those different nuclei is. And that actually works quite well. Uh, this uh, multiple different heads that are reinforcing the uh, recognition of cells uh, and segmentation at the same time. So they're uh, kind of uh, sporting each other uh, because the objective function is a combination of the three. And we showed um, in a paper that just came out towards the tail end of the last year in medical image analysis that this works quite well. So this was part of Simon Graham's PhD and Simon is now a data scientist with us in the Path Lake project. Um, and what we did was we looked at three different data sets. One of them, two, two were publicly available, Kumar and CPM, but we also released our own data set, which at that time was the largest data set that was available out there uh, for various different kinds of nuclei with segmentation masks and class labels for every single nucleus. Um, in the colon cancer specimens, we called it CONCEPT data set, the colon nuclei segmentation and phenotyping data set. Um, more recently, we have uh, taken another algorithm that we call NuClick that goes from clicks in the nuclei to the boundaries of the nuclei. And that works in the following way that it takes a few clicks from the user in the middle or somewhere near the middle of the nuclei. And then it generates inclusion and exclusion maps from those clicks, uh, feeds them into an encoder, decoder kind of CNN model that then generates the segmentation masks for all the uh, clicks that were made in the uh, middle of the nuclei. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip more details of the network architecture. I'm just gonna jump to the uh, experimental results. So this was presented at the Mikai conference workshop last year, uh, but more recently we've expanded it to uh, a more detailed version of the algorithm that uh, was used to generate another data set that we call pan nuke data set, which is now consisting of about 220,000 uh, nuclei across many different cancers from the TCGA data set, uh, their segmentation masks, as well as the um, nuclei types for individual nuclei. And this algorithm was quite useful in putting that data set together because we got the pathologist to just click on various different types of nuclei, and then we generated segmentation masks. And in some cases, they were not perfect and the pathologist corrected them. But um, this is quite a useful resource if you're interested in uh, developing your own algorithm for nuclear segmentation and classification. And um, yeah, so that's, that data set has been released together with uh, this paper, um, which is still on archive. Um, and uh, we've also extended this algorithm to a variant that we call Nuclic Plus, which um, takes uh, wiggles in the middle of um, uh, some uh, multicellular structures, such as the glandular structure here, and um, expands them to masks uh, around the whole structure. Uh, and this is, in this particular case, you're seeing colon cancer glandular structures, these round structures at the periphery of these structures, you have the epithelial cells, in the middle you have the goblet cells, and it is quite important for colon histology to be able to segment these glandular structures so that we can look at the morphology of those glands and, and uh, make inferences about um, the grade of cancer and how the patient might respond to a particular kind of therapy. At this point, I'm gonna pause for a couple of minutes before I move on to Precision medicine, which um, I wanted to dedicate the second half, more or less, of the talk to. Are there any burning questions? Um, feel free to like, just put your hands up or unmute if you do have a question. You don't have to type it. Mm 
There's uh, one message in chat. Feel free to post questions. Okay, that's from you, Carl. Yeah. All right. Um, shall I move on? Uh, and you can pause me um, if there are any questions. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Okay, sounds good. All right. So, um, more or less the second half of the talk, I want to talk about precision medicine and the potential applications of computational pathology. By the way, I only talked about a couple of algorithms from our group on um, various types of problems in computational pathology, but if you're interested, uh, you can have a look at um, our lab publications pages. Um, and if there is something else that interests you, uh, feel free to ping me and I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, any of the other algorithms. Um, I want to talk about uh, the applications of computational pathology to precision medicine, uh, which is where I think the whole, um, you know, fruit of the, the, the labor is, so to speak, um, as well as in early diagnosis. I think these are the two main areas. Uh, so I'll skip early diagnosis for this uh, talk and I'll, I'll focus more on the precision medicine. And this is a slide that I have... Uh, borrowed, let's say, from Bayer, um, who were not the only ones to introduce this concept, but I like this, um, uh, this uh, kind of illustration because it quite nicely illustrates the purpose of uh, precision medicine, what we are trying to do here. Um, so in general, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, paradigm used to be in cancer that we were treating everyone with the same kind of therapy. And some of the patients were responding positively, others were not responding at all. And, and there were others that were not, that were actually responding negatively to the same therapy. So these could be the same cancer, even same stage of cancer, but the, the same therapy, people were responding differently. And the idea of precision medicine is um, the mantra is that you want to find the right patient for the right treatment at the right time. And different patients can benefit from different treatments and it's all about finding the right kind of treatment, the optimal treatment for a given patient based on their DNA makeup and uh, some other biomarkers, um, how uh, those other biomarkers were looking like. Until recently, histology, i.e. pathology slides didn't really come into this picture. So this is a relatively old picture. If you look at the um, uh, relatively recent pictures of precision medicine, you will see, uh, or you should see, I should say, uh, cellular pathology, histology slides, and, and particularly the digital uh, biomarkers extracted from histology slides very much in this picture, um, being able to inform the selection of optimal, optimal treatment. And the nice thing about digital data and digital biomarkers is that they could be quite easily integrated and fused with other types of biomarkers from genomic analysis, for example. Uh, as well as precision medicine, I think um, it's not just about responding. I, I think there's also the issue of toxicity that we need to bear in mind. Um, there is the, the issue of cytotoxicity that we all know about, you know, patients um, uh, who are uh, handed uh, chemotherapy, the, the chemotherapy not you know, it, it doesn't just um, um, burn, so to speak, the tumor cells, it also affects uh, negatively some of the normal cells. And, and that's an issue that we want to uh, try and avoid or, or minimize as much as possible. There's also an issue of financial toxicity in, in particularly in countries where people need to pay for their own treatments one way or another, uh, where it can be quite a costly affair. And um, just to drive home the point about um, uh, uh, precision medicine, you know, it's, it's not just about uh, whatever you read in the newspapers or particularly uh, daily mails or whatever. Um, it's, um, you know, what you uh, have good scientific evidence for. Um, and for that, it's really important to understand the tumor microenvironment. And that has been quite a, an active area of research in cancer. I'm, I'm sure most of you know that it's not just about the seeds, which are the the tumor cells, but also about the soil that they grow in, um, and, and that's the tumor microenvironment. There are many other important players, and there are several other important structures, such as the blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels, the, the whole vasculature, and the cancer-associated fibroblasts, and the immune infiltrates that play quite an important role 
in the uh, spread of tumor in, in providing a conducive environment for the growth of tumor. And hence, um, you know, we need to look at other therapies such as the immunotherapy, which is very exciting um, and, and not just chemotherapy that targets the tumor cells. So uh, we think that computational pathology provides you a, a nice um, set of algorithms for understanding the spatial tumor microenvironment as it um, uh, pans out in the kind of uh, real histology specimens uh, with localization of different kinds of cells, which is the thing that you lose out on when you mash up the tissue and send it for sequencing. Okay, you get information about which genes are mutated, which ones are overexpressed, underexpressed, whatever, but you completely lose the spatial uh, dimension. And, and that is quite important because, again, you know, which bits of the tumor are actually tumor cells and which bits are not tumor cells, that's quite important. When you mash up the tissue, things are uh, mixed up and, and it is an important um, problem to be able to deconvolve that uh, uh, sequencing result to then say, you know, how much of it was down to tumor cells and how much was down to non-tumor cells and so on. Okay, so I call this the histology landscape. Um, it is quite important to be able to recognize the different kind of players in this histology landscape. Um, and um, we wrote this paper back in 2016. Um, that was the first one at that time, a deep learning method for recognizing different kinds of cells in the tumor microenvironment. And I think that really um, paved the way for digital profiling of the tumor microenvironment and can help us for better understanding of the state of play of cancer. Um, and here is my first example of our uh, uh, kind of inroads into precision medicine uh, for colorectal cancer, where we took this approach of um, kind of social analytics for uh, various different kinds of cells. So um, here is your standard HNE, a uh, small bit of the image, the kind of things that would be looked at by the pathologist. And yeah, they will zoom in, zoom out and say, yeah, it's grade two cancer. But that's not enough um, because we need to be able to extract some other useful statistics from this histology landscape. And that's exactly what we've done here. Take the image, recognize different kinds of cells, construct a kind of social network of those cells as if they were quote unquote interacting with each other um, and then build uh, further downstream uh, summary statistics from uh, those social networks, as in, for instance, various different kinds of connections. So this is the cell-cell connection frequency. And based on that cell-cell connection frequency, segment the image into different tissue types in a completely unsupervised automated manner, pull out the different kinds of tissue structures that are present within the image. And then from that, again, uh, extract some statistics. So we experimented with a whole bunch of measures from this painted image um, and found that one particular measure that gave us the ratio of inflammatory cells to our inflammatory tissue regions to the tumor regions gave us quite a nice stratification between uh, uh, high risk and low risk groups. So this is high infiltration, high inflammation and, and low inflammation but these are obviously low risk patients. These are the Kaplan-Meier survival curves for distant metastasis-free survival in locally advanced stage two colorectal adenocarcinoma, patients from Coventry and from Qatar. And this was a part of a Qatar Foundation funded project that we were working on at the time. Um, and it, it does quite a nice job as compared to many of the uh, genomic features, um, it, it does a better job of separating the high risk and, and uh, high risk and low risk patients for met free survival. And this is quite important for stage two colorectal adenocarcinoma patients because we don't really know. Um, a surgeon can't tell you, a pathologist can't tell you which one of those is going to uh, progress uh, and which, ones, uh, which one isn't. Um, and that's quite important to know which ones are more likely to progress because then we can treat them more aggressively and, and the ones that are not so likely to progress, we can um, go easy or, or a bit uh, less heavy handed on them. Was there a question, Carl? Um, there was a bit of spotlight. I, I don't know what that meant. Oh, uh, I didn't see anything. Um, okay. Oh, I think you've been spotlighted. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there's a little pin next to you now. 
Okay. Um, well, I feel chuffed. I've been smart. <laughs> All right. So, so moving on, um, the other story that I would like to talk about in the context of computational pathology for precision medicine is um, in the uh, backdrop of uh, global burden of cancer, and particularly um, in the third world countries, where here you're seeing some WHO stats for um, the, the advanced world at the top. Uh, in blue is the incidence, in red is the mortality for cancer. And at the kind of bottom half, you're seeing the less developed regions of the world um, where incidence and mortality are unfortunately quite. Um, close to each other. So effectively, um, you know, the diagnosis of cancer is pretty much like a death sentence uh, in a lot of cases, unfortunately. Um, and that's quite, quite important and, and very close to my heart um, as I come from Pakistan, from South Asia, and uh, there, oral cancer for uh, a number of reasons is one of the major cancers, whereas in the UK, it's usually not even in the top 10. In South Asia, it's often in one of the top three cancers in terms of incidence. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, it, as I said, in Pakistan, it's the highest incidence rate among cancers, second highest mortality rate, very low five-year survival. Just in this hospital alone um, in Lahore, 13,000 new cases every year um, due to use of smokeless tobacco and beetle quit chewing. So a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, non-biological factors. Um, and, and there is little known about the key pathological signatures, histological signatures, particularly corresponding to the various subgroups uh, that have different outcomes. So we took a stab at this problem uh, funded by a Global Challenge Research Fund. Um, and we took the approach of uh, trying to measure the abundance of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, again, are the immune cells. And here we are measuring the literally the abundance of um, lymphocytes that have managed to infiltrate right in the middle of the tumor. So for instance, here in this case, you're seeing this red bit is tumor and the green bit is lymphocytes. And you can see these lymphocytes have kind of surrounded the tumor. And that's usually a good sign in a lot of cancers. And, and the same goes for oral cancer as well. Um, so just cut to the chase, we uh, again uh, developed deep learning algorithms for recognizing the tumor regions and the lymphocytic regions, um, and then converted them into a kind of heat map of where those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are. And if you're interested in how we generate that heat map, you, uh, you can have a look at this paper, which details how we compute that till abundance score so this is a heat map of the Taylor Bunner score. And from that heat map, we can then uh, extract further summary statistics that, that we have shown uh, to uh, stratify patients into low risk and high risk groups quite nicely for disease-free survival. Um, and that's uh, uh, another story that I'm uh, quite proud of. And recently we've started another project. In fact, it's already been going on for almost a year. Uh, funded by MRC uh, together with colleagues at Birmingham, where we're looking at exactly same thing in oropharyngeal cancers, um, and, and the results are quite promising. Um, so we have extended this study to quite a large study, UK-wide study, that is looking at um, uh, oropharyngeal cancers from multiple different centers. Uh, and one of the strands there is to investigate the uh, um, prognostic value of the Taylor Bunner score uh, for those cancers. Uh, another work that um, we've done recently with colleagues from Birmingham again is looking at uh, the proximity of collagen. So this is again in the backdrop of uh, the stromal microenvironment that uh, the tumor sometimes um, makes uh, use of, uh, apparently recruits um, the collagen fibers for it to spread to other parts of the body. And um, what we've done here in diffuse large B cell lymphoma is to come up with a signature based on the proximity analytics of collagen and tumor and um, paint the picture um, that was originally a, a boring um, blue and uh, pink picture, blue for hematoxylin that binds to the DNA, pink for cytoplasmic structures uh, that um, uh, eosin binds to. 
And here you're seeing multiple different uh, colors for the collagen fibers that have been uh, constructed with uh, uh, the help of this proximity analytics algorithm. That works on collecting um, number of cells from in, in the vicinity of every collagen fiber and then labels them as red or green or something in between, depending on the number of tumor cells that are found in the vicinity of those collagen fibers. So this four number fingerprint helps us differentiate between fibers that could be recruited by the tumor cells for, for spread and, um, uh, uh, and that uh, proves to be helpful in terms of uh, uh, again stratification of patients into low risk and high risk groups for overall survival in this case. Um, these are very preliminary results and we're now uh, in the process of uh, extending these to a larger cohort. Towards the last part of my talk, I would like to talk a little bit about um, how the magical um, deep learning algorithms have been um, shown to predict various different kinds of things that would not have been possible uh, to even think about before. For instance, in this paper, um, it was shown that you could predict with good degree of accuracy age of a patient by looking at their retinal fundus images or gender with a pretty good AUC or their smoking status with not so good AUC, but still it's quite remarkable that, you know, looking at retinal fundus images, you could predict gender and age. And more recently, we've seen uh, a couple of papers just uh, uh, earlier this summer came out in Nature Cancer, which showed that you could do um, deep learning on histology images across different types of cancers in TCGA in this case, for detecting clinically actionable genetic alterations without doing any genetic sequencing, any genomic sequencing. So that's quite a remarkable uh, feat, I think, in itself. Um, and this is another one that came out in exactly the same issue from a Cambridge group that showed uh, that you could do, uh, again, deep learning on uh, these histopathology images to predict mutations, to predict composition of tumor, transcription status, um, and survival, which I think, again, is quite remarkable. However, when we dug deeper into this paper, we found that in a lot of cases, um, well, the, the, what they call significant were um, where the AUC was greater than 0.5, uh, which I think is questionable, but also um, there were only four cancer types that showed an AUC of more than 0.8, and for prediction of histological subtypes and grades, AUC was 0.59, so not um, ideal, but nevertheless, a great um, study. You know, this is an incredible piece of work, uh, lots and lots of experiments and uh, quite interesting results on predicting uh, transcriptomic uh, data from histology images, which someone would never have thought of as being possible even before. And in some cases with uh, pretty good accuracy. So uh, over the last um, year or so, we have been working in this space as well. And I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, unpublished results, in this case for breast cancer, predicting HER2 status, which again requires either uh, uh, some kind of a genetic test or multiple different markers to predict the status of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Herceptin epidermal uh, growth factor. Um, and, and sorry, not, not Herceptin, so this is uh, where the Herceptin is actually quite effective if the patient is HER2 positive. And to get that result, uh, usually you either do some kind of genet genetic test or you would do uh, multiple immunohistochemical stains. Um, and for the same cohort that was published in the pan cancer paper for the HER2, uh, we got um, uh, quite nice accuracy of 0.82 as compared to 0.73. And uh, we can also highlight areas of the image that are kind of lighting up uh, and contributing to that prediction of positivity as compared to negative cases, which are not lighting up so much. And another problem that we looked at was prediction of uh, microsatellite instability in colorectal cancer cases. And again, for the same cohort that was used in the first pan cancer paper, we get uh, an AUC of 0.9 as compared to 0.77, which you know is quite interesting and starts getting into the realm of uh, usability for clinical practice. And that's what we are trying to explore now with our clinical colleagues at a couple of hospitals. 
Um, we also looked at uh, prediction of uh, genetic mutations such as um, BROF and KROS, and there again, we show um, quite reasonable accuracy of 0.8 uh, on those cases. Another nice thing of uh, being able to highlight areas of interest that are uh, contributing to the prediction is we can then look into those areas and we can look at the cellular composition and extract various types of features that can um, throw some light on how uh, you know, certain kind of morphological features could be picked up by pathologists. So discovering novel features that can uh, predict the status of uh, the molecular status from uh, looking at the histology images. And particularly MSI is quite important in colorectal cancer because MSI high cases are the ones that are more likely to benefit from immunotherapy. So in the immunotherapy regime, this is quite an important uh, problem uh, uh, to solve. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, next few slides and jump straight to uh, Pathlake, which I would uh, like to talk a little bit about, as Mudassa said in the introduction, this is a, a center of excellence funded by Innovate UK, uh, one of the five um, in the UK, but one of the two in uh, digital and computational pathology, the other one being NPIC, led by uh, Darren Trainer at Leeds. Um, we call this our center path lake. Uh, so it's co-led by our Coventry Warwickshire Hospital on the clinical side and Warwick, our group on the computational side. And PathLake stands for Pathology Image Data Lakes for Analytics, Knowledge, and Education. And our vision is that uh, we want to digitize the hospitals that are part of PathLake. Uh, and that's the first step to uh, enable the introduction of some of these AI algorithms for cl clinical adoption. Um, and we also want to put together data lakes that are well curated and have associated metadata together with pathology images that are annotated by expert pathologists into the data lake to drive um, AI innovation so that uh, we could get those algorithms validated and gone through regulatory approvals in a systematic way because we have these um, benchmark data sets that we are putting together uh, that can enable the commercialization of those algorithms and finally their adoption in clinical practice. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and our vision is that we're going to put together reference data sets a bit like TCGA, but for particularly for uh, AI in pathology. Um, and we hope this would be the world's largest pathology image repository. And in the process of doing that, we're also uh, developing proof of concept solutions of AI uh, algorithms for uh, a few particular exemplar projects on early diagnosis and personalized treatment. And we hope that we can also demonstrate that uh, introduction of those AI algorithms can result in NHS savings and patient benefits. Um, we, in the process of putting these data lake together, we are abiding to the FAIR principles, i.e. making sure that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump to my second last slide about what we are trying to do here in the big picture. We're trying to um, bring some measurements, uh, some counts, some interesting statistics, some useful information about the raw pixel images that the pathologists are looking at so that they can get better handle on the state of the battle that is cancer in particular and other diseases. Uh, between the immune system and the, um, the uh, cancer cells in case of cancer, and be able to provide some predictive analytics for risk, risk scoring, uh, for progression, for recurrence, um, and ultimately be able to integrate the pathological signatures, the histological signatures with genomic signatures and other type of uh, information that may be available at hand. Um, and with that, I'd like to Thank you, and uh, of course, thank uh, all the wonderful PhD students and postdocs who do all the hard work and our funders, um, and thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, so we've got one question already in the chat, actually. So, um, so Alex asked, um, how, many, how many patients do you need to build, a, build one of your uh, models robustly? Yeah. This is a question that almost always comes up, how, how long is a piece of string, right? Um, so um, if you talk to our um, postdocs, PhD students, they will say the more the merrier. 
if you talk to our pathologist, they'll say the less the merrier, <laughs> right? Um, because obviously they are the ones who are ultimately going to have to do all the boring annotation and labeling for every individual cell and um, at uh, other levels. So um, yeah, usually we don't require hundreds or thousands of cases. So it depends on what level of uh, granularity you're working with. If you're working with individual cells, then in a single whole slide image, the kind of images that I showed you before, uh, there are tens of thousands of cells of different types. And uh, often images from a few dozen cases suffice for training algorithms for recognizing different types of cells. And then if you're interested in multicellular structures, such as the glandular structures, then we go to dozens or maybe hundreds of images. And if you're talking about uh, weak supervision, which is kind of what we did in these last two cases where I showed you those hotspots for uh, predicting uh, molecular status from images. Um, if you only have the weak label available at the slide level, then we're talking about probably thousands. So I can't give you the exact figure, but all I can say is dozens, hundreds, and thousands. Right. Um, I realize we're getting close to the hour. Um, I will continue to ask the questions that come up in the chat, and then they can go in the recording as well in case anyone has to leave. Um, if you're okay, if you don't need to leave exactly uh, three, Nasir. Um, so we have another question from Mick, um, which asks, can these algorithms be adapted to look at quantitative immunofluorescent tissue images and so quantify the expression of each marker in each cell? I guess that's related to the normalization. Yeah, algorithms could. Um, that, that's a great question. And obviously in biology labs and, and in discovery, there is a lot of uh, use of immuno immunofluorescent images on um, tissue specimens and, and um, in petri dishes, of course. Uh, so so um, some of the algorithms are very customized and specialized for the kind of histology image data that we're working with. There are others that are more general. Uh, so for example, there's a network that we uh, published by the name of Micronet which we showed to perform equally well on immunofluorescent images as well as the uh, histology images. Um, and, and you could always take some of the networks and you could do transfer learning um, on the immunofluorescent images and, and see how it works. Simon has hands. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Simon, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, thanks for, for that talk, that was very interesting. Um, so I'm particularly interested in what sort of, do you have any idea what sort of structures it is learning? I know I realize that this is a hard question in deep learning. Um, for the things like the microsatellite instability and the BRAF mutations, mm -hmm. I was very surprised that you were saying that you pull out particularly like the BRAF mutations, what? Yeah. what yeah. So, so this is unpub unpublished data. I can't say very much about it, but for MSI, I would say that uh, we find more often than not that uh, there are uh, you know, quite a uh, reasonable number of TILs, tumor inflating lymphocytes in the uh, image uh, regions that uh, are highly predictive of MSI. Uh, and that's in line with the existing literature where people have shown that uh, MSI high cases have um, relatively uh, large number of TILs uh, found in those cases. Um, and, and for BRAF, again, um, there are certain histological features that uh, we've shown uh, are being uh, highlighted. And there are some novel features that um, we've also pulled out. And again, that, that's uh, a paper that we're about to submit, so I don't wanna um, say too much about it just yet, but um, um, hopefully, uh, you know, soon it will be in the public domain. Thank you. Can I ask a quick one? Jeffrey, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, might be quite naive from the imaging point of view, but uh, we, this is in the context of your histology landscape uh, you mentioned. So in TME, so we work with the kind of more uh, genomics data like single cell RNA sequencing. Mm -hmm. Use that data 
and even the, the other assays as well to come up with the dissection of the cell cellular composition of TNA. So we know that these populations are important. They're doing something there, but mostly without the uh, spatial context. Mm -hmm. So do you think, I mean, the, I mean I've, I'm, I, I'm not up to date at all with this imaging literature. The, what can you say on, in terms of um, looking at the pathology images of the relevant tissues? Can you put the ads to some of the spatial context to those, those individual populations? I mean, you could yeah, so the, there is a kind of new emerging area that you may have already, some of you may already know about the spatial transcriptomics, right? Where again, it's one step uh, forward in my view um, you know, to single cell sequencing where obviously with single cell sequencing, a lot of times, again, you're separating out those cells. So the tissue doesn't remain intact and hence you don't really have that spatial dimension information about that um, very much and and um, you know if you can integrate that spatial context um, you'll see at the end of the day um, this the, the battle that you know the battlefield is the histology uh, landscape right it's it's not happening it's you know some random mutations whatever the effect of those mutations is it's playing out in that battlefield and, and histology images give us a kind of snapshot of that battlefield at a given time. Um, and, and granted that it's only 2D, but there is a huge amount of information that is present there in terms of the uh, local, the spatial relationships between the different kinds of cells. And, uh, and, and that's why I think the, the study of spatial tumor microenvironment is so much more powerful. Still early days, but there's a lot of evidence emerging that, um, you know, features extracted from spatial tumor microenvironment are much more powerful. The other thing is they also help us understand better um, how, you know, some of the, uh, the uh, progression uh, phenomena might be actually happening on the ground. So I call this the ground reality, the, the tissue, um, you know, what's happening there, right? I'll, uh, I'll let Jeff ask his question now. He's put his camera on <laughs> rather than me do it. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, assuming you can hear me here, um, yep. just a, sort of a follow up on the uh, on the normal normalization um, algorithm, I guess. Um, and just wondering if it, if it's uh, it's pretty obvious, but is it a is there a conceptual model? Is I guess that's sort of related to the question about how else this could be applied. So, is it really agnostic, or is it using something about the stains, for example, these two stains use these particular, you know, have these color spectrums or, or have these various concentrations. So is there, is it uh, like an, an, an image normalization routine or is it a stain uh, normalization routine? I guess it's a stain, like stain normalization more like. So um, you would provide a reference image and you would say you want to normalize the color distribution of your image according to the color distribution of a reference image. Right, or you could have a bunch of reference images, and you could collect the distribution of uh, uh, stains and, and you know relevant stains that are uh, present in all of those images. And you can say, you know, I want to um, standardize my image to the center of uh, the distribution of all of those other reference images that I provide to you, or pick any one of them and, and normalize according to all of them, and then put together a single uh, uh, normalized image. I must say that this is a, a slightly old work. Um, it was early days back in 2014, 2013, 14, when we were working on this. Recently, um, you know, we have seen that color augmentation does as, as good a job as you could expect from stain normalization. So uh, oftentimes we are now not even having to do any stain normalization uh, because a lot of times color augmentation takes care of some of those variability um, uh, factors in, in the stain that, that you normally find. So we can now model the variation in stain and um, you know, factor out that variation as part of the, uh, the neural network modeling. Can I ask a follow-up? Is that all right? Uh, yeah. the, uh, that's, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if we're going to use that algorithm, I saw the toolbox is available there, so I'm, I'm quite interested, obviously. Uh, it, do you uh, 
if you can maybe help me out here quickly, is that, do you feel like there's information lost as a process, as part of that uh, normalization process? Are we losing part of the image that we maybe we're not, we don't know to look for? So if I was applying it elsewhere, would I be worried that I'm losing information or is it lost? Yeah, that, that's a very important question. Um, and um, the, the short answer to that is that, uh, you know, we can't be 100% sure. We sometimes see some kind of fake texture artifacts um, that, that we don't necessarily want to see there. And um, again, you know, it's, um, it's an open question how much changes in the original image the uh, model is uh, tolerant of because we know that sometimes small changes, imperceptible changes in the image can um, produce really unwanted um, results. Uh, from the uh, neural network models. Um, and uh, we're looking at those kind of adversarial examples and um, you know how much changes the network is tolerant of uh, before it can flip its uh, classification label. Can I ask another one? Uh, I mean, I'll allow it if you say it doesn't mind. So, so I do have to go in a couple of minutes, but um, uh, I'm, I'm okay for now. Uh, how do you see this fitting within actual clinical setting in terms of you know, GCP compliance, et cetera, with it being neural networks and deep learning? Okay, um, I think you're uh, uh, kind of referring to explainability, interpretability. Okay, um, yeah. so um, obviously that's an issue and our, that's very much at the back of our minds when we're developing these algorithms in Pathlake in particular with the objective of uh, rolling them out for clinical practice, hopefully one day. Um, our um, approach to this problem is that, um, uh, you know, there is this idea of end-to-end -end learning that you chuck images in, predict some label for your images, and it doesn't matter what happens in there. Uh, in, in our group, we've taken the, um, the view that um, using deep learning algorithms for recognizing various important players, um, you know, doesn't really matter what the algorithm is seeing, um, if you know what I mean, as long as we get decent accuracy in terms of recognition of different types of cells, for example, and then we build our, all the downstream analysis on the results of the deep learning algorithm. That's one approach. The other is the um, top-down approach, which is what I showed towards the end, which is that you start off with, um, you know, doing a, a kind of scan of the entire image and picking out areas that are lighting up that are contributing to the final prediction. And then you drill, drill down into those areas and you see what kind of structures um, may be contributing to that final prediction uh, and picking out patterns from all of those areas that are lighting up. Um, and I think both of those approaches are or can be made quite interpretable. Uh, we're not just relying on some black box that is magically telling us what the end result is. We're actually looking deeper into areas that are lighting up and areas that are predictive of the final label. Um, and, and, um, and that gives us, um, the hope is that that can actually give us better understanding of the biology of cancer as well. And it's not just a way of, uh, you know, uh, better prediction all the time and improving the accuracy and AUCs all the time. It's something that can actually help us understand things better as well. Does that make sense? Well, I think on that, we should probably call it let you go. <laughs> but thank you again for a, a really brilliant talk. Uh, really sorry, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, Nasir. Thanks a lot. It was thank a really nice overview of a lot, lots of work in your lab. <laughs>